Hi viewers, the me and team here. Uh, welcome to my next Let's Play. And uh, I'm going to do a bit of a difference here. And go back for an old uh, classic Super Nintendo game. It's not the first time I've done it. I was happy with my Ogre Battle Run, even though it was cheap. But in this case, I'm going to go with a game that seems to have a bit of a cult following. And uh, in some languages that I'm not familiar with, they've even modded the game so you could play as uh, different... Uh, territories. But anyway, I'm going to run this at double speed. I think I can cover most of the strategies that I use, you know, even during double speed. And uh, it should make things run a little bit more smoothly. Now, uh, first things first, this is a turn based strategy game from like early 90s on Super Nintendo. It also came out for the Genesis, which I believe is what the hacks are on. I'm not doing that though, this is just the basic game. And pretty much your goal is to take over every single territory on the map. Now, this is just Mongolia. It's the first scenario. If you win this by 1214 AD, you go on to the World Conquest scenario, which we'll see at the end of this. Although, um, I'll leave it up to you guys if you want to see me run a Let's Play of the entire World Conquest. The reason I picked this particular map is that it would go uh, much more quickly in terms of number of videos for... A hey, uh, let's play. So, alright. I, I picked uh, Togorol Khan uh, deliberately because he is the worst uh, starting position on this uh, particular map. Well, his uh, military isn't bad. Like, he, he has better troops than Genghis Khan and um, pretty much the other guys, other than the red team over there, which is already going crazy on us. But uh, his problem is that he starts off, he's already uh, pretty old. I think he's like late 50s or early 60s or something. So, you know, back then, people didn't live that long. So, you know, he's already towards the end of his lifespan. And his son is pretty bad. His son is an E in politics. And that can get really painful. There's uh, four basic leader stats in this game. Politics, uh, war, leadership, and charisma. And I'll, I'll get into those later. But for now, I think it's a better idea to just explain what I'm doing. Now, what I was doing the past couple of turns while I was blathering on about non-gameplay related things uh, was gifting... Well, at first I switched policies to construction and just herding so my people wouldn't starve. Um, construction is basically how you get your economy going. Uh, you raise population that way. It has a secondary effect of improving your defenses as well. But the primary reason I was doing it is so I can get more gold. At the end of every year, you get a uh, mass of gold. And uh, depending on your construction, how many people live there, and how loyal to you they are, yeah, you'll get different amounts. So you can get anywhere from like a couple hundred to thousands, depending on how well you've built up your, uh, your individual territory. So what I did was I set the policies to uh, improve construction, and then immediately gifted to my people until, and I, over the course of several turns, until I got them up to maximum loyalty, 100 there. That's the uh, statistic at the bottom right. So, that um, pretty much allows me to maximize what they'll give me. And since uh, I don't really have anything else to do now, I'm just sending my generals out to try and threaten people to see if they'll give me money. It's really not effective. Also, uh, Togorol Khan's starting generals are reasonably bad, uh, for the most part. His son is terrible in politics, makes a bad ruler, but he's actually pretty good for fighting. So, at least you're not a total waste there. But, it's still not great. So, basically what I'm doing is biding my time until merchants are in town. That's the easiest way to make money in this game. Building up construction is uh, the second easiest. But if you can get two different merchants in town, you can just buy from one and sell to the other and make some money. And I got a little bit lucky in this game in that the Chinese and the other guys were both... I'm not going to try to pronounce that. They were both there relatively early in the game. So I was able to buy silk from the Chinese and sell it. Um, it's a shame that the Venetian merchants are not in the Mongolian scenario. If you buy silk from the Chinese and sell it to the Venetian merchants, you, like, double up your money. It's crazy. 
So that's pretty much the way to go when you're playing the world map. But I'm not, so I only get the T's two merchants, and I mean, it's it's a better use of your body points um, than most other things once you've set up your empire. It's just to play around in the market. Uh, obviously, the rate thing at the top right affects prices. It's like a dumbed-down economic model. Uh, if the rate's really high, things are expensive in the market. If the rate's low, they're cheap. So... Buy low, sell high. Nice and simple. This game isn't trying to like reinvent the wheel. I and mean, economy matters in it, but it's not the primary focus. So, the other thing I did early in this game was train up my troops to 100%. That's not as important as buying arms for them, but it's another thing you can use your body points for when you don't have anything else to do. And it makes them less vulnerable to getting ambushed and uh, less vulnerable to getting the confusion status when they're fighting. So that's... it, it helps. Um, there's actually a lot of options in this game. For a Super Nintendo game back in the day, uh, pretty impressive depth. I would say maybe a little bit less um, strategic depth than Ogre Battle, but a lot more tactical depth. Like, what you do on the battlefield really matters, and I'll showcase that a little bit in this uh, Let's Play as I con start conquering territories. But for now, I'm just biding my time. I'm trying to build up of en enough of a money base so that I can get to a uh, 20-unit army. Uh, there's actually a number of ways you can go in terms of conquering the uh, enemy territories, too. Like, if you just use your leader and run in there with four really quality units, it's often possible to pick off their uh, leading stack uh, before anybody else can respond. Just you know, sneak in there and you know, get into a battle and hope you win it as quickly as possible, because otherwise you're going to get dogpiled and killed. But if you take out their leader, then you win the territory instantly. And you also capture all those troops, which is a huge boost. But it's also a reasonably risky strategy, and Togarol Khan's not really great in war anyway. So, And because that's risky and you can easily lose doing that, I didn't really want to do that in this. I just wanted to set up properly. Um, obviously you can just beat down and kill everybody there. If it's an empire that owns multiple territories, like the uh, Reds over there, got some engines or something, I don't know. It gets, uh, they, they can run away, and uh, you'll win the territory if they all flee too. Uh, interestingly, if the stack f number one flees first, the uh, remaining stacks have a chance of being captured, and then you can uh, use them as your own military instead. That's actually a pretty good way to pick up troops, too, or at least to get rid of enemy troops for uh, subsequent invasions. So I, I really like going for that, too. I mean, obviously it's just random chance, so you can't really do too much. I'm not going to save scum in this game or something. I I'm playing this legitimately. Also, um, your general... Statistics uh, depends what you're uh, going for. In this video, I was actually trying to uh, find somebody to arrange a marriage because Togarol Khan is a daughter. And if you, if somebody's married to your daughter or like they're your son or an heir or your brother or whatever, they won't revolt. Like if somebody, every time you capture a territory and you're not in it, you have to appoint somebody to govern that territory. And if they're related to you in any way, then they absolutely can never um, declare independence, whereas other generals can. And that's affected by the charisma rating. That's one of the uh, things that's dictated by charisma. Is the higher the charisma, the less likely they are to break free, as far as I could tell from uh, game facts. And I don't know. Oh, here I make my move. And since the market rate's reasonably low, I mean, it wasn't great, but it was good enough. I uh, decided to hire mercenaries. Uh, unless the rate's like 0.5 or 0.6, mercenaries are a little bit more expensive to hire than just recruiting, but you don't kill your population in your territory, and you don't decrease their loyalty. So if you can survive and wait until you, the market rate's low and you can just buy some troops that way, it's, it's uh, usually a superior strategy in my opinion, especially if you're abusing the market anyway. I mean, you might as well just keep abusing it. And here I see that the rate's really low and take the opportunity to max out the arms. That affects how many arrows your archers have and how much damage your troops take. Although the quality of the troops affects it more. Arms matters too. So I bought arms there. And then I'm just going to train up my soldiers to 100. 
And uh, next video, I'll showcase an abusive strategy. So uh, until then, enjoy what we've seen so far. And the me and team signing off.